Morning, everyone. <clears throat> you know, I, uh, like Justin said, I've been taking a, a few days to really just get away, and I believe this is a now word. I believe this is a, a word that has impartation for today. I feel like I got this one on my knees, and um, I believe that if you're here for this or if you're watching us, there's a reason for you. It's not just a casual day. That something tangible is going to take place today. So let us, let's pray <clears throat> and pray with me. Holy Spirit, we need you. Lord, change is hard, but without you, it's impossible. Holy Spirit, we need you. Lord, Holy Spirit, come, anoint uh, the word. Lord, uh, penetrate to the back of the room, to the farthest portions of our television, our video. Lord, God, let lives be changed. In the mighty name of Jesus, <clears throat> amen. Let me start by asking you this question. It might sound uh, in, the, in the beginning just a little strange, but if you'll, if you'll give me a little liberty, we'll go through it. What if the biggest impediment to you moving forward to that place that God has been promising you, that thing that you've been believing for, where you've, you've, you've seen something, you're, you're moving forward. What if your biggest impediment, the thing that's keeping you from your assignment, from seeing the world around you change and your life being changed, what if the single biggest impediment is really you? Now, <clears throat> I don't mean that flippantly. I'm not just saying that to get some sensational response. As I've been praying, I want us to see this picture really clear and I want to title this message, The Indispensable Hope of the Helmet of Salvation. In 1 Thessalonians it says, But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation, that thing that guards your mind, the helmet of the hope of salvation. So why do I say that? That we can become our biggest impediment, our own worst enemy. What if the single biggest thing keeping you back, it'd be you've been praying for the fulfillment of your assignment to see change, but what if it's really you? Because in order for God to move in your life, somebody hear this with me today, in order for God to move in your life, he has to bring disruption and uprooting to things that have been building your comfort zone, to things that you've been relying on, to things that were last season, and now he's moving you into a new season. But without the helmet of the, helmet of the hope of salvation, all you can see is the disruption. Amen. One person's there. That's all right. We're going to build this one. A little plowing this morning. But So think about it. as Listen, I don't know what theology you have about how change and how the kingdom of God comes. But as heaven is pressing down in this age, like never before, as heaven's getting closer, this demonic realm is being pressed. You remember that uh, in Revelation it says that the devil is released with great fury knowing that his time is short. And as God is causing you to go into that place of promised land, the thing that you've been praying for, he has to uproot things in your life. He has to change these things. And if without the helmet of the hope of salvation, we get caught up in the destructive process that God is using, but it's a redemptive process to pull us into the new thing. I've been living there. This, this message is one that was birthed in my heart. I, I just want to remind you that, you know, uh, you, you see people stand up here and preach, but oftentimes God is using incredible lessons in our lives. You know what I mean? If, if it's not working at home, I don't want to export it. He's using us. And this last couple of weeks, God has been showing me. And uh, let's take a couple of uh, pictures. Look at, look at Mark 8.31. Perhaps no... More significant picture than this. You guys remember the story. I want to pick it up here in Mark 8, 31. Jesus has been with the disciples. They've left everything. They're following him. They're seeing miracles happening. 
Um, they're going from town to town and crowds are coming. But this is part of a process and this season is over and Jesus tells him, come on, turn to someone and say the season's changing. You gotta see it. Because Peter here doesn't, doesn't have any clue you see what happens. Jesus starts to talk to them, and he says, listen, that was a wonderful season. The offerings were great. People were coming. I'm preaching. But now the true fulfillment, the release of the thing that was prophesied from the foundation of the earth is about to be released. The Holy Spirit's going to come. You 12 people are going to be transformed into super disciples, but it's going to look different than you expected. I'm going to be handed over to the chief priest. I'm going to be killed. It doesn't look like you wanted it to. And Peter literally takes him aside and rebukes him. Think about it. Now, I know the tendency when we read these scriptures to kind of, you know, look backward and say, well, you know, Peter missed it. But that would have been you and I. And how much so in this portion of our life, Lord, everything's kind of okay. You know, I'm, I'm doing all right. I'm living in a land of lethargy. I'm living in routine. I'm living in my comfort zone. Why are you disrupting this to get me some, you know, Lord, I can't see it. All I see is that you're breaking old relationships off and you're, you're causing this thing to be disrupted. That's all I can see. It's because he has a purpose for you. And he loves you and he doesn't want you to stay in that. God has a purpose here. And Jesus looked at Peter and he rebuked him. He said, get behind me, Satan. He said, you can't see the plan of God. You're only seeing the things of men right now. Let me just make it as plain as I can. If you don't get the power of the hope of the helmet of salvation, you'll only see the natural. And you, man, I feel like if you've been like me, sometimes you feel like you're losing your mind when you see things happening. Because this, this isn't a battle for your heart, it's a battle for your mind. I mean, you get this, this piece of armor, you know, it's not the breastplate that protects your heart and protects your faith. It's a helmet that protects your mind. Your thought life is coming at you at 1,500 words a minute. And if the devil keeps injecting into you a, a, just a, a reinforcement of what's around you, you're going to miss it. Let's look at another point. This is an, another credible point of transition. We pick this up in the story of Exodus. So help me out with this. Those of you that are watching, those of you that are here, put yourself in this position for a minute. So the pain of slavery has been so significant in Egypt. The beatings, the oppression... It's been going on for so long, and this promise has been dormant of deliverance in your promised land. Turn to someone and say, your promised land is coming. Next time we do this, you're going to mean it, because their promised land was coming for them. And look at what God had to do. He brings Moses into that situation and performs the most extraordinary miracles ever recorded to this time. He causes plagues to happen. He causes the Red Sea to be parted. I mean, could there be a more sensational deliverance of the people of Egypt or the people of Israel out of Egypt? It was sensational. But once they get out... Without the helmet of the hope of salvation that you and I need to have today, it's a vital piece. Look at what they say. Oh, that we would have died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. When we sat by our pots of meat and we ate bread to our full. I mean, it's mind-boggling that they're wanting to return to Egypt, to slavery, because the tyranny, come on, the tyranny of the familiar was more powerful than pushing through the radical change necessary to come into their promised land. Some of you, God is changing your friends right now. He's changing your situation 
because he loves you and he's propelling you into something. I mean, it's, it's hard for me, you know, you read these things, you know, you pick up the story there, you know, they're walking along and they're like, <laughs> I'll do my, my, my Jewish prisoner in person. You know, it wasn't so bad in Egypt. I had one square meal a week. It was wonderful. Mostly leeks and onions, but it was good. And, uh, you know, the guy that used to whip me, he was so gentle. He would only whip me like two, three times a day. It was great. You know, we loved it there. Now we're going into the promised land. Come on, somebody. Don't get your eyes focused on this transition period without a revelation of the promised land. That's all you're going to see. I, I, this, you know, the scriptures are clear that this particular point in time was brought about for our personal edification. This scripture is a reminder to us. So what is this thing? What is this thing that God's imparting? And I believe tangibly today he's imparting it. Let, let me just say this really clear. This is not a Tony Robbins seminar. Great respect for Tony. He's a great guy. But I'm not just talking about the power of positive thinking. I believe that there is a tangible gift, uh, a, a, a position in Christ that can come over you and it can give you such clarity that it transforms the situation. That's what Tony Robbins doesn't have. I mean, he's a great guy, but in this room, we've got G-O-D himself. We've got the Holy Spirit that knows everything about you and knows your future, your past, and he's willing, ready, willing, and able to give you this powerful gift of the hope of salvation today. He's been waiting for you to get here. I've been waiting for you. I've been praying for you. Justin and I have been praying for you. So what is this? Hope is the vision that allows us to believe that what we are going through will be all right on the other side. Come on, somebody. That thing, that warfare that you've been going through, those trials, those, those things, they're being used for God's purpose in your life. Don't get your eyes off of that precious promise. Don't cast away that hope. Don't lose sight of that because once you do, you're going to start to focus on the turmoil and the upheaval. But God's going to give us this helmet today. I'm excited, man. I could do like a little dance. If I, if I knew how to dance, I would do one. I'm that guy that like knocks everybody down in the line dance. I'm, you know, six foot two, 250 pounds. And when I go the wrong way in a line dance, I take down a row. You know, my heart, I feel like a ballerina, but practically I'm more like a linebacker, you know. So I'll spare that for you. We'll keep on. This is the assurance of salvation. It says it's the helmet of the hope of salvation, that thing guarding our mind. I don't have time to go into it, but it's different than the breastplate of over our heart, the, bless, the breastplate over our faith. Let, let, me, let me give it to you this way. This is, this is not part of this message. It takes too long. But unless your mind is protected, you have no grounding for faith. Why? Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Come on, wrap your head around this for a minute. I can fight a battle with one arm. I can't fight a battle with no head. On all the sports that we see, you know, whether you're, whether you're playing football or, you know, uh, when you're riding a motorcycle, there's a protection that's especially made for your head. And this just isn't some uh, kind of figure of speech that Paul is using. I believe this is a tangible thing that God's going to give us this powerful gift today that we're going to be able to be protected from these bombarding thoughts of the enemy. Without the helmet of salvation, your unguarded mind receives a pounding from the enemy. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I believe that, that we've gone through a season. How many of you have felt like literally sometimes you're going crazy? 
You try, no, no, I said not a show of hands. But <laughs> we'll do altar call right now. But you know what I mean? The, it seems like the very thing you're praying for all of a sudden starts to shake. And the enemy starts to bombard your mind. It's never going to happen. It's not your time. You've made this up. You've missed it. All those things that he thinks are, you think are just common to you, are, they're, they're actually going on around all of us. But now God is bringing this powerful defensive weapon. Without the helmet, it's producing ungodly lies and ungodly beliefs. All of a sudden, this starts, this starts to permeate our mind. Have you ever noticed that the enemy speaks in first person? He doesn't say, you're no good. He has this thought that I'm no good. He doesn't say, you're going to fail. You say, I'm going to fail. He starts to use this thing. And without the helmet of salvation, it's difficult to distinguish. I'm drawing this out, but we're going to go someplace. You're going to do the victory dance. Willie, get the chairs cleared. We're going to do some laps in here. All mental attacks from the enemy have this in common. They focus on your shortcomings and they're amplified and they project them into the future. That's what the attack of the enemy looks like. That's how you can tell that it's an attack on your mind. What does that look like practically? He's saying, I'm no good. I can't make it. I'm at the end. My money is run out. Uh, my friends are leaving me. My book won't be finished. Whatever that thing is. And he's projecting it into the future. It's never going to happen. You're always going to be this way. And without your ability to stare that devil down through the helmet of the hope of salvation and say, I had your head last year and I'm going to have your head now. If you could have taken me out, you would have taken me out before the point of salvation. My God is able to see this through. He's powerful. I'm going to come out better, stronger, faster. He's using this for my edification. He's building me up. You know, I don't know how we think sometimes that this building up of capacity happens, but when you're praying for wisdom, he's going to give you a problem you've never encountered or never solved before to stretch you. Sometimes when you're praying for breakthrough in finance, you see this constricting happen because he wants to see what's in your heart so that he can trust you with more. When, you know, he's bringing you into a new place and he's going to give you new friends and relationships and that, that ministry you've been praying for, some things start to crumble. They start to, you know, there starts to be uneasiness. Maybe you're praying for a new job or something and all of a sudden there's friction in your boss because he loves you too much to let you stay in Egypt. He loves you too much. He will cause whatever situation he needs to make that thing uncomfortable, to propel you into that place of transition. With the helmet of salvation, when we put on that helmet like we're going to do today, I believe that there's a supernatural release coming. We see the chaos and the unraveling, but we have the ability to expect with confidence the coming kingdom movement that we've been waiting for. Suddenly we become like Rocky in that, remember that one when he was fighting Mr. T? You know, he got so afraid the first time he fought Mr. T, he got all beat up. But then that second time he fought him, his, his uh, humility was there, he'd been training, and Mr. T would hit him and he'd go, is that all you got? You know, he was, when, when you look at sports psychology, the people that get in a slump aren't the people that... Uh, uh, just focus on, uh, boy, I'm going to strike out when I'm at play. They actually get mad. There, there's this, uh, in psychology, there's a self-abasement scale that when they look at high-performance athletes, they have the ability, when they've struck out four times in a row, they're not like, oh, man, I'm going to strike out again. They're like, this time, I'm going to knock it out of the park. And this, this is just in the natural. Think in the supernatural what's happening today. Some of you desperately need this. I, I feel like I've been warned for this message. We have the helmet of the hope in place so that when we see lawlessness and warfare, but we continue to somehow increase in expecta expectation and eagerness towards a victorious end. 
you're going to see this turmoil, this chaos, and instead of focusing on it, you're going to go, oh, you know what? My victory is closer than ever before. If the enemy says I'm going down, it's he knows I'm going up. If he says, listen, the devil's a liar. If he says you're coming to your end, you're just beginning. If he says it's a time of lack, it's a time of abundance. Jesus said he speaks his native tongue, which is to lie. We turn that thing around. Now is the time for your victory. Without it, we can be rebuilding what God is tearing down. And I don't want to see a show of hands in this. But so many times I've fought to preserve things that God is tearing down. So what does that look like? We get accustomed to things. But what does it say? Every branch that bears fruit. Come on, somebody. Oh, one person. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes. You know, I was, when I was preparing for this, I was reading about uh, pruning grapevines, you know, just kind of getting into the, the meat of the message. And I was reading this article by one of the universities, and it said, don't be afraid to prune back more vigorously than you might have thought. Because this is the thing that's going to produce a harvest. I'm like, Lord, why are you cutting these things back in my life? Why, you know, this, Lord, I've got this one little grape on this branch. I've had it there for a year. Why are you cutting that thing back? Because he wants you to have an abundance. Oh, Lord, I've been holding on to this codependent relationship for so long. Please. He wants you to be free for those new relationships that are coming your way. Maybe, there's, maybe it's a finance thing. Come on, somebody. I want to hit this one with you. I feel like when people talk about finances, they cherry pick the scriptures. They really do. I, I don't have time to talk about it, but God is a God of abundance. But there are conditions for those abundance. There are conditions for answered prayer. I don't have time to talk about it, but you search the scriptures. If two of you agree is touching anything, you'll have it. If you abide in me, you'll ask what you will and it'll be done for you. There's conditions. There's conditions for wealth. And one of it is developing a prosperous mind. There's ne Let me just say it this way. There's never a good result in Scripture for someone that takes his one little talent, digs it in the ground, and hoards over it with all he can. That never works out well. It's always the, the person that is seeing God, the God of abundance, able to take you to the next level. Every branch you branch through. So these are the questions asked. Now, I'm not going to say we're going to go around our table, but please have some uh, reflective time today. Uh, maybe you can take them with you. I should have asked this earlier, but if you don't have notes, you can raise your hand and the ushers will bring uh, note pages to you. You know, I'm going to be, uh, I think, the last person on planet Earth chopping down trees and making notes for you. Everybody else has gone digital, but I, I had something about paper. I love writing on it and taking it home and putting it in your Bible and stuff like that. Just go ahead and raise your hands. They'll bring you. Uh, <clears throat> Here's the questions to ask. Is there a fear, an ungodly belief, an insecurity that has penetrated my mind, causing me to misperceive what God is doing. This could be a wealth wound that causes self-sabotage where you heard mom and dad fighting about money or maybe you grew up in a home that was really, really tight and now when abundance starts to come, somehow in your mind you're equating abundance with fighting. You know, I mean, I know this sounds crazy, but that, that stuff happens on a deep level, doesn't it? Maybe, it, maybe it's a relationship that you know is not productive for you, but you're afraid to let that go because, you know, you're not sure what's going to happen. You've had this codependent relationship, but God is bringing you someplace. Is there a fear? Is there an ungodly belief that if you step out with that book, that new ministry, if you really go after it, somehow you're going to fail? We're going to talk about what it looks like to make this right. What past victories can I write on my helmet 
to give courage and perspective over my present situation. A lot of times these helmets, when they dug them up, would have inscriptions and insignias from battles. And I've noticed, uh, you notice with military array, a lot of the medals and uh, the pins are significant triumphs that people have made. If that's true in the natural, how much more in the spiritual? Devil, I remember when I had your head back in Jamestown. I remember uh, when you tried to push me back, I came out double for the trouble. I remember when you tried to take all of uh, my uh, finances away, I was blessed. I remember that time, uh, or that revival, or that, that uh, maybe it's something that you've written that other people were blessed by, but you can rehearse these things so that when the enemy comes, you can respond to him quickly like a, like a judo expert. You can use, just discard that thing, push his, um, push his, use his weight against him, use that force against him. Can I look at the change and the unraveling around me and rejoice in God's ultimate plan? There's the key. Without it, imagine... Imagine if you, ladies, if you went in to give birth and you didn't know you were pregnant, right? For some reason, I mean, this has happened before, but for some reason, you're like, you know what? I just keep gaining weight. It's terrible. And now I've got all this pain. But if you know, you're, in that situation, you're focused on the, the present situation. But if you know this baby is coming into the world, I know there's pain. Uh, uh, you know, I've had the privilege of being there when my kids are born. And, but, you know, you forget the pain when the child comes. Amen? Some of you, God has given you vision again of what's coming. Ladies, I really believe this. There's some here that you've come this close to giving up a prophetic utterance over your life. You've almost stopped to believe in it. You, you know, it's been too long and you, you feel like you've waited too much. But God is going to restore that because he wants you to participate with him. To look at the chaos and the unraveling, but rejoice at what's coming in your life today. I want to do some activation, but I want to tell you I've got a, a book special for you. I know this is an awkward pause, but I really believe in this. I wrote this little book so that you can give it to people that don't know Jesus. It took me a long time. Uh, I'm going to give you the book, The Strategy for a Fulfilling Life, the 3C Companion Guide, which is a $15 uh, item, the video, The City of God, this one, The Profound Shift, and Three Keys to Higher Ground. It's fifty two eighty four. but am I going to give it to you for that? No. no. I'm going to give you everything, the book and all the material for $7.99 in the bookstore today. Limited supply. So let's do this. Go ahead and stand with me. We're going to make some declarations. We're going to put on this helmet. So just go begin to just pray. Just pray over yourself. Just, just begin to pray. Just, Lord, I want to receive this. Like I said, this isn't a Tony Robbins meeting. It's not just here to psych you up. I believe God is here to impart to you today. I believe he's going to give you the helmet of the hope of salvation. And all of a sudden, the crap that you've been going through, can I use that word? It's going to start to make sense. You're not going to just see uh, the turmoil, the unraveling. You're going to see that God is using it for an intended purpose. <clears throat> So let's go ahead and make these declarations and prayers with me. We're going to start with the first one. God, more than ever, I need a vision of my future victory. All right, one person was there with me. I'm going to keep praying. You ready? God, more than ever, I need a vision of my future victory. Lord, make it clear right now. Pull it down from heaven. Pull it down from heaven. I believe there's some and you've had multiple visions and God is clarifying right now. Number two, I appropriate today the helmet of the hope of salvation. I just, Lord, impart that right now in Jesus' name. Those of you that are here, those of you that are watching, that onslaught of the enemy that's been pounding your mind is being broken off supernaturally today as he's imparting to you the helmet of the hope of salvation. 
Number three, I declare I will walk boldly knowing God is orchestrating everything to bring about good in my life. He is a good God. He is a God of love. He is more for you than you can imagine. And right now, all of that stuff is going to pale when that ministry is birthed, that business is birthed, those finances are birthed. You're going to see this like a, like a woman. You're going to see this infant, and all of the pain is going to be forgotten. And number four, as Justin comes up with us, I declare today is the day of new prophetic insight for me, my family, and my future. Put your hands like you're receiving from God. God, let it come down like the spring rain watering the earth, that we are going to get a clear vision, a vision of our future in you, Lord God, that we're going to just, Lord, these momentary light afflictions, Paul said, won't sway us because of the joy of the grace, the joy of the ministry, the joy of the release of those new inventions, ideas, uh, people, places, and things over our life in the mighty name of Jesus and give God a thank offering right now as though he's done every piece of it. His credit is good.